Anyone that knows Gert Wings knows these are the elite of the elite. The they are absolutely breathtaking. I'm James Mitchell from Gert Wings. We're literally doing 16, 17 hour days and we're getting penalised for it. I went from being a bit of a party animal to literally nothing but fried chicken. And I said to everyone, we need to get packed down as quickly as possible. And next minute, all hell let loose. What has been the lowest point? We both quit our jobs, took it on full time, and then, yeah, COVID hit. Why in the fuck am I doing this? The industry is on its knees. It sounds like a hell of a stress. There's going to come a point very soon where it could go bang. I've just finished a podcast with James, the founder of Gert Wings in Swindon. And it was amazing to hear how a business that can look so good at the minute on the outset is so difficult behind the scenes. His story of his ups and downs throughout the business's lifespan is going to be inspiring to loads. And if you're ever interested in doing this type of thing, then this will be an amazing listen for you. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. So welcome to Road to Success podcast. James, please tell us who are you and what is it that you do? I'm James Mitchell from Gert Wings. Uh, we are a chicken wing and fried chicken street food trader who trades all around Swindon, Bristol and the Southwest. A hell of a popular one at that as well, because I've been along and the queues are crazy. And I wouldn't just have any old business on this podcast. What I witnessed myself when we turned up the buzz that is around this business is really why I wanted to get you on today. So what got you onto this path? Like where did the idea for Gert Wings come from? Like what, and what was before it? Like, how did you get here? That's actually a big mistake. Actually, it, wasn't a big mistake in the, the in the negative sense. It was actually a big mistake in that it just suddenly happened. Uh, I had a good job. I was traveling, working for my family's business, traveling all over the world. I was in Australia, Europe, um, America, and used to go to America probably about four or five times a year, eat a hell of a lot of buffalo wings over there. And this is going back sort of 10 years. Um, and at the time you couldn't get decent Buffalo wings here. You'd come back here and it'd just be disappointment. Um, and there used to be an ongoing joke with me and my mates as to how many chicken wings I could eat in a 10 day period while I was out there working, which was a hell of a lot. Um, and then I came back, um, once and just decided maybe I should start making them myself at home so that I could still continue to enjoy a buffalo wing at home and not have to be in the States. So I started making them at home, um, came up with a few recipes. Uh, my wife, Lisa Marie, went absolutely ballistic because the house spent of fried chicken wings all the time and hot sauce. Came up with these recipes and... Um, yeah, just started feeding them to mates and they were like, these are amazing. Other people were like, you should. And this all started from going to the States? All started going from the States. So was, was this like a few trips that built up this love or was this just like one trip? Oh, no, it was a, it was a, it was a load of trips. Like, like I said, I was there four or five times a year. So I was always over there and I'd always have buffalo wings and I'd try different buffalo wings in different restaurants and different places. I'd look up places before I was going, say if I was in Chicago. I'd look at the best place to get wings in Chicago, go and try those wings. And yeah, and then eventually just started making them at home and um, and that's where it took off, really. Amazing. Well, can you recall then from there the first time you ever sold some of your wings? Yeah. Uh, so the, we did loads of trials. So I bought a couple of uh, commercial fryers, again, for a laugh, had no experience in cooking. Had no experience in catering, just was in the food game anyway, but thought I could give it a go. So bought some uh, commercial fryers, bought a gazebo, bought a few other bits to try and get going. And then we got our first break. I think it was after about eight or nine months of testing the water and doing stuff for family and friends' gardens. And we did more brewery in Bristol. They gave us our first break. Little brewery. They don't charge you for being there. You go there, you set up, they give you beers, and we 
we give them food sort of thing. And yeah, that was where we started selling our first wings. And because everyone knows Gert, now I would say, especially from your follower base that's watching, for long queues outside a very cool van that smells unbelievably amazing <laughs> at some car park somewhere on an industrial estate. But obviously from that story, it didn't start there. It actually started in gazebos. Started in gazebos, yeah. A little three metre by three metre gazebo. That was the cheapest way to start at the time, I thought. Um, so we had the gazebo um, set up, which was very painful. Um, setting it up, packing it down. When we did Moors on the first time I ever did a gig uh, at Moors, the whole day was brilliant. It was beautiful sunshine. It was in April. Um Loads of people came out, didn't expect it. But I mean, I didn't make mega money, but it, it was good for first shift. I, I was totally gobsmacked at how good it was. And it got to about eight, eight o'clock and I thought we better start packing down. So I went around the back of the gazebo to undo the gas bottles and could just see this massive black cloud coming towards us. And I could hear rumbles of thunder, bearing in mind it had been boiling hot all day. And I said to everyone, we need to get packed down as quickly as possible. None of us, it was my wife and my sister and me, um, none of us were experienced in getting it packed down quick. And next minute, all hell let loose, thunder and lightning, wind, hailstones, the whole thing got absolutely soaked. Everything in it got soaked. And I was just like, why in the fuck am I doing this? <laughs> I've had a couple of pack downs fishing like that before. Yeah. Tent's gone in the lake. You're just watching it bob along. It's an absolute nightmare. So that's what triggered the spark of right. I need to upgrade now. No, no, I did. I did three solid years of years. gazebo work in every type of circumstance you could possibly think of, from thirty odd degree heat outside where you're absolutely sweltering in a black gazebo with fryers to minus five, minus six, where you've got gazebo weights where you're having to smash them on the floor because they're iced together and the gazebo won't open up because the inside of the gazebo is iced so much from inside being in the van where it's gone in damp and then it's iced up because the temperature outside is so cold. Um, to doing mm -hmm. all of that, yeah, for three, three years I did that for. Um, and then my best mate gave me a van um which was our first ever van which we used to carry everything around in it was a um mercedes sprinter luton van he's a truck mechanic um he's got a business called truck serve in bristol and he got this van that this company didn't want to repair and he said i've got a van for you and i was like well i haven't got the money to be buying another van at the moment like and he said no just i've put a new engine in it for you so I've got it, got it fixed up and ready to go. Um, come and get it and see how you get on with it. Um, and if you like it, we'll talk about money. So I was like, right, okay. So we went up there to go and pick it up. He'd had it all signed, written up, which I was absolutely shocked at. I was like, what's he going to want for this? I haven't got the money. Like everything I've had, I've invested in equipment. This is just a friend of yours. Just a friend of mine. And... Um, got in the van and he explained everything about it, how to use it, had a tail lift on the back. And um, he said to me, so you get on, I've put it on my company insurance as well. It's taxed, everything, go and use it, see how you get on. So we drove off down the road, me and my wife, and he hadn't put any fuel in it. It's a bit tight. <laughs> 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 <No>. <laughs> Joking. Um, and we stopped at the first fuel station to put some fuel in it. Um, my wife said, there's a card here. Have you opened it? And I said, no. And he, you know, she opened it and she said, it said in there, thanks for being best man at my wedding. Uh, best man speech was absolutely amazing. The van's yours. Good luck for the future. Yeah. So, so that just a random, well, I say a random, not a random, but an act of kindness. Yeah, unbelievable. It goes such a long way sometimes in helping someone. Yeah. With the, and I bet he's uh, eaten a lot of chicken since then. As he well. hasn't actually. <laughs> <laughs> he's eaten a bit, but not loads. But yeah, so we had that was our first truck, and we used that to carry the gazebo and everything around him, which was a very big truck for that. Um, and then we got a smaller van, which was easier to use and maneuver stuff around in the gazebo and stuff. Um, a little Vivaro van. And then this van, the big van that we had, we weren't using. 
And I had an idea that I was going to kit it out and loads of people were like, oh, don't do that. Don't don't kit it out yourself or oh, you'll be in the right mess doing that. And um, COVID hit and we didn't know what was happening. We had to take, uh, we'd just gone full time with the business at this point. I was going to ask that. So, so you mentioned going back a step yeah. that you were doing this. You mentioned your wife. So what? when did you, and you said you've been doing it for three years, when from starting the business, which was 2018? Uh, 17. 2017. From yeah. starting the business, how long was it before you went full time and who was doing it initially? Uh, so it was me and my wife doing it majority of the time uh, in spare time with help from friends and family. Um, and then we did did Wingfest in London. We were the only trader outside of London to do it that year. Uh, and we picked up third place best buffalo wing. And I was like, we must be on to something here. So um, went on for another year, I think, after that. And at that point, I was thinking, right, I need I've got to. got something here. Yeah. So we took the leap. Lisa Marie was working at uh, BMW. So we both quit our jobs, took it on full time. And then, yeah, COVID hit, which in March the following year. So we'd been going since September full time since September and then yeah COVID hit and I was like oh dear and the first reports back were that Bristol City Council were saying that if they were to ever let a market go up ahead again there was a high possibility we wouldn't be able to trade in gazebos okay so I had a panic on um and got the other truck and me and my brother-in-law kitted out lined it all insulated it put all the like uh, wipeable surfaces in there, built uh, countertops, got a hatch cut into it, um, put some fridges in there, freezers, put the fries that we had. And you did that in lockdown? It did that in lockdown. So it was almost a blessing in disguise. Yeah. Um, got it all done. And then literally two weeks before they said the markets were going back, uh, Bristol City Council changed their mind and said we could use gazebos again. <laughs> How did that make you feel? Uh, I was all right about it. I mean, we used we used that van for certain things, so certain events like Westmead and certain places we used the truck that we built, and then other things we carried on using the gazebo for, um, just to have both side by side. So we had two options, um, and then eventually that van didn't wasn't big enough or suitable enough to carry on with what we were doing, we needed something better. We needed something bigger. Our, our output was low in comparison to what we could be doing. We were selling out in a lot of places early because we just didn't have the output. Um, so at that point, decided to uh, get this big truck that we've got now. So Gert truck. Yes. You've got a nickname for all the trucks. Yeah. You? So the first truck we had were the one that my mate gave me was Gertrude. This one that we've got now is Katrina, and then the small vans, Gert Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> and it must be, a lot of the guests will know anyway, especially if they visited and want to listen to this, if they've been there. But for anybody that doesn't, just explain what's really unique about your business. I don't see loads of people doing this, is that you travel to different locations every night of the week. Am yeah, I right in saying? Pretty much. Um, yeah. So just tell us a little bit of where you go how that all works and then other things you do as well, like events, like what does the business look like when you're out and about? So we have fixed locations that we go to in the week. So as an example, on a when every Wednesday, you'll always find us at lunchtimes at um, Finzel's Reach Market in Bristol. And then as soon as we finish at lunchtime, we pack down and then we drive to Swindon and then we go to the Hot Kettle Brewery and then we set up there and we start serving there from five to eight. Um, it used to be Westmead Industrial Estate, but we've moved to the Hot Kettle because obviously people can have beers and stuff like that and working with another local company works well. Um, and then Thursdays, we tend to do Harborside Market every other Thursday. And then the Thursday, we're not at Harborside Market, which is in the city centre of Bristol. We are at Temple Key Market, which is behind Temple Mead Station in Bristol. And then in the evening, we'll go to a local pub somewhere that doesn't do food that we've got an agreement with that we'll sell food there. Or it can be, uh, there's even shops that we're working with now, Touts in Bristol, we're working with them. 
they've got garages, forecourts and stuff like that. And we pitch up outside the front and it brings people into the, into the stores and they come and get food off of us as well. So. So I'm guessing location, location, location is a massively important part of the business. Yeah. Because you have to get enough space for people to park up, enough space for people to come or footfall traffic as well. Yeah. So it sounds like you've got it pretty figured out with who you partner up with and where you go. But I'm guessing to some of the locations you have to fund being there as well, especially if it's like a market. Yeah, you have to pay the markets to be there. You pay a pitch fee and then you pay your, your um, electricity charge as well on top. Some places don't charge you, some places do, because some, play, some pubs see it as a, an opportunity to bring more people in and people will drink and have food there. So, yeah, it works both ways in, in some cases. So from that entire load of information, we've gone from a gazebo taking off into a car park to the largest truck of all of them <laughs> and selling out from wings. And you mentioned COVID as well, but that was actually a blessing. So in that journey, since you started your own business, what has been the lowest point? What has been the most difficult part? And what would you say was like the eureka moment? Um, the, 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 the best part is having the truck. That, that's, been the, that's been the main thing for me, having a truck fitted out to a spec of how you wanted it, how you wanted it to look, to be involved in how it was built. Um, that was the that was always the dream was to have a truck. Um, so that's the biggest highlight for us and the customer base that we've grown over the years. I mean, I can remember setting up our Instagram page with no followers apart from one, which was me of my personal account, and now it's got twenty. I think it's nearly twenty two thousand followers. Um, and then we've got five thousand on Facebook, um, and Twitter as well. That's um, all organic. That's all organic. Yeah. All of it's all, all organic. Um, and then the lowest points for me is trying to grow, I think, um, in an economy that isn't necessarily helping people grow. Um, as an example, the, the VAT is a massive issue for us. Um, we tried We tried to expand last year. Um, and we went into a place called Blue Collar Corner in Reading, which was a kiosk, which should have been great. But the the cost of having staff, uh, the PAYE, the national insurance, everything like that. So this is a physical location. This is a physical location, okay. yeah. Um, and those staff being there for for 12 hours days. I mean, Harry, who works for me, he managed it, and it sent me and him to the practically because it was so stressful you have staff not turning up staff arguing and fighting um you're there for 12 hours a day you're busy at lunch periods between 11 30 and one then it dies off and then you have nothing all afternoon but you're still open the fries are still got going because you might get the odd customer in um and then you're busy again from say half five to about half eight and then you have to be there till 10 o'clock at night. So what I'm hearing there is, I'm not sure if you foresaw it, but I really, I'd speak to a lot of different business owners and things that sometimes new business owners underestimate is sometimes how difficult it is to manage people. Yeah. Would you said that was the biggest challenge in having a physical food store? Massively. Yeah. Managing people. I mean, there were some days where Harry was in that kiosk on his own serving because somebody hadn't turned up or something had gone wrong. Um, there was days where we were supposed to be off and we'd be over there. I mean, my days off, I was over there trying to manage problems or manage people or situations, and it was just a nightmare. And you, you're over there for 12 hours a day, and the money that I could earn in 12 hours, I could probably do in the truck in three. So And Harry's one of your team now. Yeah. So what does your current team look like and how has that progressed over the last? So we've had lots of ups and downs. When we had Reading, we had um, quite a large team. Um, and then as we shut Reading after six months. That was months, the store, yeah? Yeah. Shut that after six months um, and then moved in and then just solidly focused on the truck, which has allowed us to double up everywhere, do more shifts, do more time. And I'm lucky that I've got the team that I've got. So I've got Harry who's worked for us. He would have been with us for two years this September. 
Um, he got thrown in at the deep end. Uh, I had a girl leave um, unexpectedly after Wingfest Bristol, um, and Harry was due to start that week, and he'd never done it before. He'd done a few bits of helping us out, um, done a few covered shifts, and had helped at Wingfest. But okay, so he'd done bits. He'd done bits, but like he got chucked in at the deep end. We started on the Wednesday after Wingfest, and. I was just like, right, you need to do this, you need to do that. It was just me and him. and We got absolutely slammed in Bristol. And he just got on with it. He just literally got on with it. Didn't even think twice, just literally did everything. You turn around and you go, have you, and he's already done it. And that's the mark of a good employee. He is, if it wasn't for him, I don't think we'd be here. Like he is a massive. It's funny, so you can take from that, having um, a business, is sometimes the most difficult bit is people. Yeah. But the bit that makes it work is also people. Yeah. So it's de- I think definitely finding the right people is one of the keys to success for good business, especially in the hospitality sector. And you touched on earlier that, I mean, one of the challenges at the minute is the economy in that sector and the VAT on food. And we were, we were chatting earlier mm-hmm. and you were telling me about the fact that the way the VAT currently is in the hospitality and food sector is literally killing off food trucks and businesses that are trying to survive. Could you just tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, there's so everything we everything we sell has twenty percent on it. Everything we buy practically doesn't. So my chicken, my raw ingredients, my flour, all the things that we buy, lots of, has no VAT on it yet. Everything we sell has 20% on it. So there's a massive amount of VAT that goes to the government to the point where it's at breaking point. It's, it's, it's not a joke. Anybody in hospitality will tell you there's been um, people rallying the government to try and get them to change it, to knock it down to 10%. Then They're not listening. They, they won't listen. And the fact that they cannot see the amount of breweries takeaways, restaurants, those businesses are closing weekly. There's there's so many of them that you could list off that are closing. And it's down to the fact of high energy costs and VAT. And people can't expand. We So even if it was just a break for a period of time, like they, they reduced corporation tax and they've only just put that back up. Yeah. Um to help people get through it. So you think there needs to be something to literally I think it save needs to, it at the minute. I think it needs to be a break full time. I think for hospitality in general, if you go to Europe, you go to certain places in Europe, it's about 9%. Some places even as low as 6 Um, So, and it, that's ongoing. That's not like a, a break, oh, ha, have six months on us. That's that's a full, full-time full thing. And people can progress in that. I, I genuinely cannot expand with the current format. It doesn't work. And that is because, just for vis- uh, listeners, thinking, you know, how how is that having an impact? That is because that is eating into your gross margin because you're not able to claim back as much VAT as you're giving away. Yeah. So if that's 20% and say you're only claiming back, say, five of that, then you're negative 15% gross margin just to the tax man. Yeah. And then people say, oh, well, why don't you put that 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 percentage on onto your menu prices? Well, our menu prices are already high because oil's so high. Flour is so high. The cost of our, our chicken is so high. What, Every, is, what is like a box, like a, like, I don't know, like three pieces of chicken, some tater tots and sauce? And uh, for, for three strips and uh, tater tots, you're looking at £11 for a regular meal. Which, Do you remember what that was when you started? Uh, the menu prices have changed, but originally, I mean, now we're, we've tried to keep We've tried to keep prices the same. We have, we've gone up little increments here and there, but we have tried to keep as best as we possibly can because we're competing against traders elsewhere that aren't even mm-hmm. that registered because they work to 85,000 and then they stop. And there's no way to carry on running a business if you want it's to no, do it better. It's no way to carry on running a business, but it's also not good for the government because if the government look at it, these people are stopping working after 85K because they don't want to pay the VAT. There's, there's no more income for them and there's just no incentive anymore to do well. You go out, you break your back. We're literally doing 16, 17 hour days, seven days a week. And we're getting penalized for it. 
And I just think it's totally unfair. And that is you guys, which, you know, from an outsider looking in just at the pretty parts of the business for say, is it looks to be thriving in terms of customers. Sales definitely doesn't seem to be the problem. When, no. when I turn up, I'm, I'm a frequent customer. And when I turn <laughs> up, one of my problems is patience. And I'm like, oh, here we go. <laughs> it's the i got to wait and make sure I've got enough mates around me to keep me interested. <laughs> but the smell keeps drawing me in, which is good anyway. But I can't believe something that I pick up on when I'm stood there like about to order is you, you get to the window, you feel the heat coming out of the truck. And you mentioned earlier about good people. Like it must be difficult sometimes in the summer, sweltering temperatures and three of you inside a van in that close proximity to fryers. You ever get any heated moments in there, even though yeah. you all get on? Yeah, we do. I mean, me, Harry and Mark. Mark, he he's done loads of wing fests for us and um, he was originally a customer. He came on in January of this year after two years of badgering him to come and work for us. And he's come and work for us. Now, me, him, and Harry spend more time together than I spend with my own wife. Like, literally, we are in the back of that truck all day, every day. Um, we've just taken on a member of staff in Bristol um, to try and alleviate that. So she comes on and does the till um, three days a week so that we can rotate an extra day off for each of us because it's getting to breaking point. It's, it's, it's not any good. For, it's not healthy for us to be in that environment for that period of time. Um, it's hot. It's stressful. You have to deal with problematic customers quite a bit. Um, and it's it's just not a great environment to be spending long periods of time in. And literally from Wednesday to Sunday for the last, God knows how long we've spent all that time together in the backs of those trucks. Can I just have 30 seconds of your time? I need to tell you about Fowler Digital. This is my web design and digital marketing agency. And without it, this podcast would not be possible because it literally funds its, its existence. And it's quite an expensive old thing to run. So to keep bringing you episodes, all I ask is that anybody that you know that is in need of a website quote or some work doing to their existing site, maybe a new site building for an online store, please get in touch with us. We can do the full shebang from start to finish. Anyway, without further ado, let's get back into the episode. Three of you in that van together, yeah, working in that close proximity, somehow not strangling each other in intense heat in the summer and all the rest of it. You all make it work and you make it work so well that when we just went inside your unit or if you scroll down your Instagram feed, I see the happiest photo of you with not one but two trophies <laughs> like that, giving it large. Yeah. Um, and they're not the only two that you've got. So not only do you just go out and sell and run a business, I feel like this is a massive passion of yours, clearly from what you're talking about in the States, going out there to try all different wings and going back and planning when you're going to go. So tell us about the chicken community <laughs> and um, what the awards look like and, and what you do as part of the whole, everything that makes the business up. So the, the chicken community, I mean, you've got, it's grown massively over the years since I've been doing it. Like I say, when we first did Wing Fest, uh, we were the first trader outside of London to compete. Um, now that's a very different story. There's some other players from all over. They've got, they've just had Wingfest Derby, which is up north. Um, they've now got Wingfest Bristol, Wingfest Manchester, Wingfest Birmingham, and Wingfest London. London's the big one. Um, and all the traders come together, and then we all compete for the best buffalo wing and the best wild wing. Now, the buffalo wing obviously has to be buffalo. It can be your own take on it. You can put spin on it and change it slightly, but it has to be a buffalo wing. Wild wing can be absolutely anything you want it to be. It can be way out there. People have done all sorts of weird and wonderful things. You've had um, peanut butter star wings, strawberry daiquiri wings. Yeah, you name it. And when we did a um, West Country wing once, which we soaked the chicken in Somerset cider, 24 hours with loads of herbs and spices, took it out, put it in a flour dredge with um, smashed up pork scratchings. When you fried it, you had this like crispy outer with pork scratching in it. Um, and then we made a apple cider and cinnamon sauce to go over the top and then put crumble of pork scratchings over the top of it. And this is all self-taught. Yeah, it's all just crazy ideas. No cooking school, university, no, no this, that. no that. This no. is, go, get out there and, and do it. Do it, yeah. 
now nowadays or fast forward on Harry tends to do a lot of the menu development more nowadays he's very keen to do that type of stuff he's got some great ideas um, I tend to get bogged down with paperwork and the actual running of the business um, so his main focus is on menu development um, and coming up with ideas weird and wonderful ideas for Wingfest but yeah the, the, the wing community in in comparison to what it was, is massive. There's chicken wing shops everywhere now. There's loads of them. There's some big players um, all over. And we all come together for the festival, all have a massive laugh. We all compete against each other. And yeah, it's just a so good- How competitive is it? Uh, it can be competitive, um, depending on who's involved. Um <laughs> You. <laughs> um, well, me, but not necessarily. I think this year, I've said to the guys this year, we've been doing it since 2017. Um, this year, we want to dominantly focus on enjoying the festival rather than the stress of the festival because it's about coming together, everyone having a laugh, serving it. I mean, we end up cooking, last year, Bristol, we cooked nine and a half thousand wings in two days. Nine and a half thousand wings. I didn't. In a Mark, food truck. Mark and Harry cooked nine and a half thousand wings in two days. Yeah. <laughs> so, but behind that, like behind any great business, there's always a back end as well. And you mentioned that if Harry's coming up with that creative now, yeah. To cook nine and a half thousand wings, you need a pretty good supply chain. Yeah. How is that for you? Uh, it's a nightmare at the moment. Um, farmers aren't being farmers are being charged a hell of a lot for electricity like the rest of us Uh, they cannot keep going the way they are they are already screaming out the poultry council the British poultry council have already said in the news the industry is at breaking point Um, we can tell that just from some of the quality or the supply that we're getting through. Our meat is specced. We have a certain size wing that we require and want, Um, and that's been dropping a lot lower than it should be recently because they're putting out chickens earlier than they should do. It's on its its knees. The, The industry is on its knees, and this is why you're not seeing eggs supermarkets because um, supermarkets won't pay the, the fair price that the farmers want for the eggs and the same with meat and there's going to come a point very soon where it could go bang what does bang look like uh, a lot of poultry suppliers just disappearing and we'll be left with not a lot of poultry suppliers so the no. cost of meat will just be horrific yeah that's coming down. That's like they're saying it's going to be similar to what we had with the um, fruit and veg crisis about three, four months ago. But they said that there was, we had no tomatoes, but it'll go on for a lot longer. That's, that's the biggest headache coming down the line. People need to be aware of that. That is, that's almost definitely going to happen. I said um, off, off podcast, I said earlier, we went into a group, me and my friends, we walked into a Nando's in Farnham the other day and was told they had no chicken when we went through the door of Nando's. And the girl telling us, you could see it in her face, just couldn't believe what she was saying. So when you were telling me about your supply chain, I just put the two and two together and thought it must be the whole thing. Yeah. KFC ran out, didn't they? Remember yeah, KFC ran out. And it's, it's a similar thing that's coming down the line again, but it's going to be a lot worse because... The poultry farmers are being charged so much for electricity. I mean, to to run those farms must be absolutely horrendous, like the cost of, of running them. The feed is is doubled in price, if not tripled in price. Everything that goes into that supplying poultry has gone through the roof, and they're expected to still continue to supply at the same prices, and they just can't do it. And the same with us passing on price increases. We There's not much leverage to keep doing it because – we're competing against other people and their prices aren't going up. So everyone's just stuck in this rut and something needs to change. And what's difficult about yours even more so is it's not like you can just take any old chicken, right? No, I won't take any old chicken. (laughs) So what, because 
what what kind of chicken is it that you're you're because you said uh, it's all about there's a, there's genuinely a spec you're buying almost to spec it has to be of a certain size we want high welfare chicken of a certain size it has to be from um a certain size bird we we expect wings to be of a certain size we don't want tiny ones we don't want massive ones but again at the weekend we had a batch and suddenly we had these wings that were coming out and I, they were literally would fit perfectly in the palm of my hand. They were that big. And that's great for customers. But for me, it's not great because I'm selling them a single or sixes, which means the customer's getting loads more for their money. But I'm then, I've got less wings to sell because there's less that will go in that bucket because I'm buying on weight and selling in, in numbers, which is why in the States, when you go there, you end up buying in weight. Normally, when it comes to wings, you'd buy in weight. You get X amount of pounds of wings on a plate. You wouldn't expect to go, oh, I'll get 12 wings or something like that. So, so far, it sounds like a hell of a stress doing this, working yeah. in sweltering temperature vans, three of you all together. Even since the start, some of the bits that you mentioned, and not only that, you've got over, potentially, I mean, ev- everybody, I think every businessman I've ever spoke to says, you know, this bit succeeded, but this bit failed. You had a shop, sounds like you had a go. It's no longer around. That's a stressful old journey. Yeah. Where, where's where's some of the positives in it? The positives are that we enjoy what we do. We love what we do. We love the, the following we've got and the interaction that we have with the customers. We've got people that still buy from us. They've bought from us from day one. They still literally buy from us. Some of, some of the friends that I've made along the way have been friends that I'm really good, good friends with now. Um, Positives. I just I'm just holding out in the hope that we can we look to franchise next and the the expansion and when that expansion comes that there may be some help from the government and that they understand that all of these places that are all closing down are because of energy the energy crisis and because of the VAT. Um, I don't. <laughs> I honestly don't know whether they will, but that that is what we're holding out for. But to expand the business, you want to franchise it. Yeah. But you yeah. are waiting for that direction from the government. Hoping. Yeah. Okay. But I, we can't, I mean, if we want to expand, we can't hold on forever. So we will probably just have to go ahead and, and do it. Um, but I, that's what I'm... So what you're going to drag the business kicking and screaming to where yeah. it needs to be. Yeah. And that's what we've got to do. Um, I, you- just, I just don't understand why they won't, would re- reduce the VAT. It would it would allow businesses to, to expand, to invest, to recreate what they're doing, decorate. Um, you go into some places, and places are looking haggard, and and it's genuinely because they can't afford to to do it. And all this stuff will create jobs. It will create. Um, it will bring in more tax if they were to reduce the VAT. Because all you're living off. I don't think the customers always realise that all the company, especially your kind of company is living off, is the bit in between their costs yeah. and the sale value on the evening. And it's that that they're then living off of and taking wage over. And it's so difficult to get that when that bit is reduced. It's gross margin. So your gross margin is, I imagine at the minute, really pressured yeah. because, because of all the costs, probably more than it's ever been. Yeah, definitely. I mean, oil, I mean, oil, we're lucky the oil's come back down again. But I mean, my oil, when I started... The uh, rapeseed oil was eighteen pounds for twenty liters. Um, at the start of or midway through the war in Ukraine, because of all the sunflower oil, there was a shortage in sunflower oil because of the war. Um, it pushed uh, rapeseed oil to forty. I think it went as high as forty-five pound. So we've gone from eighteen pounds to forty-five pound a barrel of oil. That's it's just it's not sustainable. We we've done it, we've got through it. I can see the stress. Now it's dropped back down, but it's not gone back down to where it should have been. The twenty odd quid a barrel. It's now uh, it sits at thirty. We're paying about thirty one pound a barrel. I can't be easy. <sighs> no, it's very, it's very stressful. It's very stressful. And then the other thing is, is a lot of people you buy from. So we buy from a lot of wholesalers and people like that. They don't give you any warnings when. Costs are increasing. 
Um, I don't know whether you, did you buy from us when we were doing wrinkle cut chips for a period yeah. of time? That we've done tater tots since day dot. That was tater tots was something I found in the states. They weren't here. Uh, I had to push a company when I wanted to start doing it to buy in tater tots, and they were like, "Well, we won't buy them in unless you guarantee you'll buy the whole pallet." I said, "Well, I'll buy the whole pallet, but you have to store it for me." Um, and we've done tater. That's what we're known for: is fried chicken and tater tots. It got to the point where the price went so high. So we went from 20, 21 pound a box uh, at the beginning of this year, and they put it out to twenty nine pound fifty. It's already expensive, and now they put it out, to, and we had to pull it. I just said I'm not entertaining it. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to do it. So we stopped doing it, and then just started doing chips, which people moaned about. Um, and then I spoke to some other people who did taste sauce. They gave me some other names of some other suppliers got with another supplier and luckily they managed to match what we were paying previously so they're now back on the menu but again that's another chips is another volatile market potato growing if there's a if there's a bad harvest in the Netherlands or Belgium or there's flooding or anything like that again prices of potatoes will go through the roof and you won't get any warning about it you'll get told on the day that it happens and that's the day you're ordering it that must be Flipping stress. How how do you deal with that stress? Like how how do you cope with your own mental health? Uh, it's been very up and down. It's been very up and down. But <sighs> there's an ongoing joke in Bristol. The amount of t- the amount of hours that we do as a company, most other traders don't do the hours that we do. People look at it and they go, "Oh, you're going, you're doing eight trades in five days." And it's like, "Yeah, that's what we're doing." How are you sustaining that? I have no idea. I'm doing it, but. I'm not a rich man. I'm not earning loads of money. I'm I'm managing to survive and do what you love. And and doing what we love. But I'm not a rich man. And some people come up and go, Oh, you must be absolutely minted. I'm like, there's my vehicle. It's a Vauxhall Vivaro van, mate. Do I look like I'm rolling? It's just because you're pushing the business so hard and it looks like the business is so active, whether well, it's locations and the effort that you put into the brand that people sometimes put the two and two together and think, well, that just means that everything's flipping rosy. But that yeah. just that actually means that you're just trying to pull it along, kicking and screaming to survive yeah. and work harder than everybody else at it. And hope that somebody gives us a break at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so ugh, we could almost say it's not lucrative crazily at the minute, but you're destined that you want to franchise the business. That's yeah. the next step. We've worked out that we are about food trucks. That's, we've worked that out. We know that we are about food trucks. We're about popping up in different areas, three hours, four hours, get it out of the door. Everyone's happy. Then we go on to the next place, and that that's what we're about. And I think we've got followings in other cities where we've done wing fests. Um, we get emailed quite often about people saying, oh, when are you coming to London next? Well, we only do London when we're at wing fest. Um, so looking to franchise in other major cities, I think is the next big thing. And that's what we're working on at the moment. Streamline everything we do as a company. And then we shall hire the trucks out to different locations. People work those trucks. They're their trucks, but they work them. Um, and then we supply all of the sources because I'm a bit of a control freak about quality control. And that was one of like. my next questions on the <laughs> sheet was sources yeah. because what we haven't touched on yet is you guys, even though you don't have um, a chicken shop like what you had before in Redden, yeah. um, in Swindon where you're, I could say, based here, even yeah. though you're known for being in Bristol the most famous yeah. one, in Swindon you have a unit. So what's the importance of that in the business? And obviously you make all your sources in there, correct? Yeah. So all the sources are made from scratch, all the flour mixes to give that crispy coating that flavor some crispy coating that we've got all the marination everything takes place in that unit everything all the meats soaked uh for 24 hours in advance so that the buttermilk soaks into the chicken and makes it more juicy um all the sauces are made in house there on a tuesday we make everything from scratch and then the truck is obviously lives in that unit as well so we're able to do deep cleans maintenance and everything from that location and you even sell those sources online? 
we used to until Swindon Borough Council decided that they wanted to give us a load of shit about the labels, which was really useful. So we had a scores on the doors visit from Swindon Borough Council uh, at the beginning of the year. I think it was February. They came in. They've I've had the same officer since day dot. So she knows me from, and I used to have the business at my house and used to use the garage as a prep kitchen. When I first registered the business with Swindon Borough Council as a prep kitchen in a garage, they literally shit themselves and came round as soon as possible because they thought garage, prep kitchen, this doesn't sound good. <laughs> they had <laughs> visions of like baby yeah. stuff being stored in there, car tires being stored in there. And yeah, when they turned up, they realized very quickly that that wasn't what we were about. We'd lined all the walls, we'd put everything in there properly, we had fridges. And everything in place. And we've always had a five-star racing since day dot. That's one of our main things. It's cleanliness and making sure that everything's tipped off in terms of documentation. Uh, fridge, um, making sure the fridge temperatures are up to scratch, our temperatures in, in what we do when we're cooking. Um, and she turned up when we moved over to the hair. And we went through everything. She's like, oh, it's amazing how you've progressed and in the, all the years I've known you and you've now got this magnificent truck. You've got this huge unit. It's absolutely amazing. Thank you very much and well done. Just one other thing before I go. She said, are you, um, are you selling your sources online? And I said, yeah, we are. Why is that? And she said, can I have a, a label? And I said, yep, yeah, sure. Gave her a label. And uh, she looked and she said, yeah, I'm not 100% sure that these are actually legal. I was like, right. Well, they've got everything on. They've got a nutritional guide. They've got the ingredients listed. And they've got the allergens listed on there. They've got those. List. Anyway, cut a long story short, they came back with four A4 pages of changes that they want me to change. Sounds like my planning permission. Yeah. My- <laughs> <laughs> and it's just so painful. And I just emailed them back saying, thanks for that. I'm pulling them from sale. I don't have time to change the labels at the moment, so we've stopped selling them. Oh, maybe that's something we can help with. I've got a digital business that basically does all of that from graphic design, labels, all the way through. So oh, nice. who, who knows? Maybe we can get you up and going again with selling sources online. That's what we love doing. But that sounds like a hell of a journey. What would you say has changed the most then since 2017 in your life? How has running this business changed your life? Uh, I have zero free time. So I went from being a bit of a party animal in my youth um, and going out loads and socializing. I played ice hockey for six or seven years to literally nothing but fried chicken. Literally, Gert Wings is my life. My wife, I'm just very lucky that I've got a very supportive wife. I've got a three year old daughter who I hardly ever see. I get up in the morning, she's in bed. I come back late at night. She's in bed. Um, We get, normally we try to do one day a week um, and now possibly two days a week with this other member of staff coming on um, to have some family time. But yeah, literally it's just a whirlwind. I'm just very lucky that I've got a supportive wife because... If you go back to 2017 and you could tell yourself, do it or don't do it, what would be... I'd do it. I'd do it very differently. Definitely do it very differently. I wouldn't have started with a gazebo. I'd start with a food truck. And I'd say that to anybody out there that's thinking of doing it, don't shortcut it. Go and get a food truck. Start with gazebos are a nightmare. You'll do it for a year, two years, and you'll want a food truck. And gazebos are still costly with everything else you need to put in there. Um... <laughs> What else? I still think it's worth it. All this, all this I, I, do, I absolutely love it. Like, I'm lucky I've got great staff now um, and it allows me to focus on running the actual business, but I haven't ha- always had that. Like, I've been literally doing everything. Um, and sometimes you finish the shift and you come back, you'd have to do all the ordering for the week. You'd have to do all the meat order and all the all the other bits and pieces, and still do adverts about where you are for the next for the next week. Update all the websites, send out orders of sources of people that ordered online, and all of that. And I was doing the majority of it with just me and Lisa Marie. That was it, just the two of us. 
Well, I think that's one hell of a story. I want to thank you ever so much for coming on. I really wanted to share your story to all the people out there that enjoy what you do, what you eat, and hopefully also show them that it isn't as easy as people think it is for you to turn up and buy people a great food they can enjoy with their friends. So thank you for coming on. Thank you. It's to talk to you and meet you. Cheers.